By an act of faith, Israel walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. The Egyptians tried it and drowned. By faith, the Israelites marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls fall flat. By an act of faith, Rahab, the Jericho harlot welcomed the spies and escaped the destruction that came on those who refused to trust in God. I could go on and on, but I've run out of time. There's so many more. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets through acts of faith. They toppled kingdoms, made justice work, took the promise for themselves. They are protected from lions, fires, and sword thrusts, and turned this advantage to advantage. Won battles, rooted alien armies, women received their loved ones back from the dead. They were those who under torture refused to give in and go free, preferring something better. Resurrection. Others braved abuse and whips, and yes, chains and dungeons. We have stories of those who were stoned, sewed in two, murdered in cold blood. Stories of vagrants wandering the earth in animal skins, homeless, friendless, powerless. The world did not deserve them, making their way as best as they could on the cruel edges of the world. Hi there, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Laura, and I'm a part of the team here at the People's Church. I serve here. We are in Constantia in Cape Town, and uh, we really are so glad that you are just tuning us with us today. Our theme this year is Build Strong, um, because we really believe that as God's followers, He wants us to build well and build strong and become strong like He is strong. But I'll be honest, I really know very little about construction, about building things, um, but I do know about quality craftsmanship. I actually studied to be a fashion designer. And uh, the one thing I really hated about my studies was the sewing. And so you couldn't really escape it, but it got so tedious after a while. Sometimes when you're sewing a skirt with a circumference of like six meters and you're just sitting there folding the little hem, you know, doing what you've got to do. And um, I would always just find shortcuts to, to kind of get things done quicker. It might be my personality, but all I really cared about was to see how the dress twirls, how it moves, how it falls. I was interested in that part, not really on how properly I sewed the inside. And if you're not a fashion designer or a seamstress or someone like that, you probably wouldn't notice either. But without fail, my lecturer would look at this and I still remember her accent so well. She'd be like, what's going on here? <laughs> and, um, and I'd feel so ashamed and embarrassed because the, the honest answer was that really I was just lazy. I didn't feel like doing it properly. I didn't feel like sitting there for hours doing things the proper way. And it probably would have been fine for an amateur fashion show, you know, just to walk down, up and down, let someone see. It probably would have lasted. But for somebody to actually wear these garments, for them to, you know, eventually sit down and stand up and move and perhaps wash it a few times, it wouldn't have stood the test of time. It would not have lasted properly because quality craftsmanship is required for real life. Even now, I still much prefer to rather buy second-hand clothing with, with a good structure and good bones rather than buying something cheap that's, you know, brand new but will last me shorter than the thing that's, that's already been worn. The bones and the foundation of our lives are what matter in the long run. It's what will allow us to go far and, and make an impact and keep standing even when the storm comes, right? So, so there are several things that we as believers need to get in order to build strong. Sometimes as Christians, uh, we know a lot of things about God. 
we know that God is good. We know that he's in control. We know that he will never let us down or abandon us or forsake us. We know. But yet, when we get into a certain space, uh, maybe the space of waiting, the space of suffering, the space of what's, what's going to happen now, uh, you know, or, or the space of this is not what I had in mind for my life, I can sometimes find myself conflicted when my world doesn't match up with what I think God's goodness and in controlness and faithfulness should look like in my life. That space can still be so totally overwhelming, even though I thought I knew. So there seems to be a bit of a gap. And I wonder if we can just look at what the Bible says about that gap, what we can do about that gap. In Hebrews 11, Hans read a part of it earlier because it's really long. Um, but I'm going to read from verse 1. It says, The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word. What we see created by what we don't see. By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. It was what he believed, not what he brought, that made the difference. That's what God noticed and approved as righteous. After all the centuries, that belief continues to catch our notice. By an act of faith, Enoch skipped death completely. They looked all over and they couldn't find him because God had taken him. We know on the basis of reliable testimony that before he was taken, he pleased God. It's impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. Can we just pray for a moment? God, I pray that as we read your word as we sort of just open up what you're speaking about here. I pray that you would speak to our own hearts. I pray that you would fan things into flame inside of us. And I pray that we would have clear understanding of what it is that you want to say to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Faith. So we're speaking about faith. I'm sure you gathered. And um, it's a pretty common word. We often use it even in non-religious circles you know you might you might hope for the best outcome and say I'm just having faith that it's all going to be fine you know or when someone is stressed out about something a friend might comfort them to help their perspective turn to a more positive light and they'll say you know just just have a little faith it's going to be fine and even in Christian circles, we can use faith in a very interesting way. We can sometimes see faith as a speak it into existence. You know, if I say it enough times, it'll happen. It'll come true, which I think is more called the power of positive thinking than faith. But faith, the real meaning of the word, has much less to do with outcomes than we think and way more to do with the conviction of the truth. Someone told me how they invited their grandma and their, or their whole family to their baptism at church and how they shared their testimony and, and said something along the lines of, I've decided to become a Christian and to follow Jesus. And how his grandmother afterwards, very confused, said to him, I don't understand. You've, you've always been a Christian. You're British. And... And so in some way, most cultures allows for some vague sort of faith in a greater being or in, in a force or hope that somebody, something out there is looking out for us. Faith is a, is a common concept. But 
this isn't what we're talking about here. Because at some point in our lives, even if we've grown up in a Christian home or a Christian culture, in order to have this faith, we need to decide for ourselves that this isn't just a nice story. That, you know, something we tell ourselves to make us feel better. This is real. God is real. This power is real. We need to get to a point where we can believe the gospel for ourselves. The story about Jesus where we can say, I believe that he was a real person who lived in a real geographical place, who then died and who then rose from the dead. I mean, this is a crazy story, but... I really believe this, as crazy as it sounds. And if that's true, then probably it means that the whole Bible is true and that the Bible then holds authority and there are implications for my life. It means that then that everything the Bible says about God is true, that, that He's good and that He's faithful and that He cares. And that one day we're going to meet him face to face. That inner personal persuasion needs to happen within our hearts first. It's the starting point. It's the central point of truth. And, and that is what anchors us in a spot. And from that spot, we figure out everything else. But one thing is certain. We know it's true. God is real and he cares for us. Ephesians 4 verse 14 says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Faith isn't an airy, fairy, hope for the best sort of and see, add on to help us in life. Faith is based in the person of Jesus and will perhaps be the only certain thing about us. But it will be out of our reach until such a time as we decide for ourselves that this is what I believe and this is what I will build my life on. But that's just the first step. That's where the adventure begins, the belief, the decision. And, and from that central point, if we start building our life on, on this belief, there's a world that opens up to us. It's an upside down world of, of invitations to trust God and to see where he takes you and to see what it is that he wants for your life. The second part of Hebrews 11 is basically a list of people who did wild things, significant things for God that perhaps would not have made sense in their normal worldly context. But because of their anchor, the, the central point of what defined truth and sanity for them, I suppose, they made their, their lives, they made decisions for their lives based on what they believed about God. By faith, Noah built the ark. By faith, Abraham left his home to go live in a strange place, in tents, uh, because he had a promise from God. He was sure about who God was. By faith, Abraham and Sarah had a baby when they were at the age of like great, great grandparents. By faith, Moses left his cozy life in the palace to obey God's call for his life. By faith, the Israelites walked through the sea on dry land. Hans read about it earlier. I mean, the list just goes on. Now I want to ask, what could your world and my world look like if we decided to put our absolute faith in God, like a radical, solid faith that's willing to do the things that God calls us to do. What could we do in this church and in this community and in this city and in this country and in this world? What could God do in our own households if we decided to fully trust him? 
I wonder when I speak like this, whether some of you, if something immediately comes to mind, are there perhaps things that you feel called to or, or moved to do that you've just not had the courage to do quite yet? Maybe it's too risky or perhaps that flame of conviction has just died down a little bit. Well, I'm hoping to throw some petrol on that fire today because we're speaking here about building strong. We want to build something of significance with our lives. We don't just want to go through the motions. I love speaking about mission, and this is what I'm speaking here, about being used for God for a significant purpose. It gets, it gets me fired up. But I'm also wanting to make sure that this faith can seep into every sphere of my life, not just the exciting big ideas, but the everyday mundane routine things like going to work and taking care of your families and managing your money and parenting our kids, making little decisions. Because this is the space in reality where we spend most of our time. And it's often the space where we have the hardest time applying our faith to. I recently spoke to a friend and she was just sharing her heart and she said, you know, oh, man, I just feel like this last, these last several years have been such an uphill financial battle and I'm just tired. You know, it feels like every time there is a bit of a breakthrough, it feels like, oh, actually there's just a bigger expense. So now we're even further back than we started. And, and she feels like, man, it just, it stresses me out. But at the same time, you know, when I look back, I'm like, oh, but God's always looked after us. We've always, we've always been fine. And as she spoke, I could just relate to her so much. Perhaps you can too. Maybe it's not finances. Maybe it's with a family member. Uh, maybe it's with your job. You might just feel like it's one step forward and, and two steps back. You know, it's that kind of setup. And so how do we have faith in these circumstances? What does faith look like when even the basic things don't work out? Well, we obviously have that anchor point of believing God, but we need to build on that by helping our own hearts to understand who God is and, and how He works. Man, our memories are so short and I forget on the daily. Um, and, but the way we do this, the way that we build on this, on this faith is by reading our Bibles and by praying and by filling our minds and our hearts with, with God's truth, by coming to church, by watching church and, and linking in with other believers and saying, man, I don't have enough faith for myself right now. Like I need someone to pray with me. Last year around November, Hans and I made the decision that we were going to move houses. Uh, we, we quickly realized that our little boy uh, was a mover and a shaker and a climber. And so the third floor became a bit of a scary thing for us. And um, we also just really were hoping to have a bit more space, a bit more of a garden, just so the kids can run around. Anyway, so in November, we had to give notice because our landlords needed a decision. And so we decided that we were going to do that, which was exciting. But it quickly became clear that finding a new place within our budget, within our requirements, wasn't as simple as we thought. But we were pretty relaxed until January came. And we thought, oh, yay, we got a place. Uh, we applied. It was great. And uh, we, were, you know, we were so chuffed. And then they rejected our application. They chose someone else, which was fine, but obviously we were really disappointed. I was so bummed. I was like, you know, became very stressed because I'm like, oh, this is January. Like we need to be out of here. We've got nowhere to go. And the place that we need doesn't exist. And I remember going out for a jog because I just needed to go run, not very far, um, but, <laughs> but nonetheless. And I remember this, this, inner dialogue that I had with myself and I think the Holy Spirit was, was speaking to me and I just said to myself, I was like, no, Laura, you've got to treat this with faith. 
You've got to believe that God is who he says he is. You've got to believe that he cares about your family, that he cares about your business, that he's going to look after you, and that he hasn't forgotten about you. Regardless of whether you're going to stay in this apartment or not, but, but you have to trust God. And so that was it, and I took that to heart, and that was my decision. Um, anyway, we decided that if the 15th of Jan came and we still didn't have a place, we have to contact our current landlords and find out if they'll let us extend our rent because, you know, we don't have anywhere else to go. And so we did that, 15th came and went, and they accepted our, our application on the 16th. And that same day, I got this notification in my email, because Property24 sends me notifications, that this house became available. And I was like, oh, this looks great. Um, and I went to, to we, we got an appointment to go view it. The same day, same day, um, we put in an application, same day we got approved. Like, this all happened really quickly, just after we had put in our extension for our current lease. And then we tried to obviously negotiate things with our people and everything was fine and it was great. But there were some other hurdles along the way, some things that stressed us out. And the one evening, Hans and I, you know, we just sat down that week before we had to move. And we said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to choose now to trust God and we're going to pray and we're going to ask God to help us to, to do this week with joy and with peace and with faith. And, and may our hearts be set on him. Because in that moment, we had a massive chunk of deposit that we had to pay, and I didn't have it at all. And we were like, whoa, this is a lot of money. But we prayed, and we just said, God, it's in your hand. The next morning, I woke up to a notification of somebody just transferring a massive chunk into my bank account, just anonymous, just says gift. And this amount was enough to cover this whole missing piece of deposit that we needed, plus something else that had just gone wrong that week that I was like, oh, this is worth the worst timing. Anyway, and, um, and so this is what happened. So, so, so we, got to, we got to pay that deposit. And the other night, I was sitting in our new house that we are in now, which is wonderful, and I was just so grateful, and I was going through my notes and I went back to a prayer that I prayed quite a while ago, a bit of a cheeky prayer where I was just telling God the things that I would really love in a house. And I said, God, I would love three bedrooms if possible. And I would love a garden, uh, you know, a decent sized garden. I would love to be in a security complex if that's possible, just because it's so nice with the kids. And, and I, I would like a new, nice kitchen and some big windows with great lighting. And I, as I said, quite a cheeky prayer that I prayed. And as I sat, sat going through this list, I realized that every single thing on this list was met by this house that we moved in. And I had forgotten about that prayer. I was just, I would have taken any house at that point, let me tell you. But I did nothing to deserve that. My faith didn't speak these good things into existence. A good and a loving and a caring and a generous God provided for us. My faith didn't. My faith is just the response to his faithfulness. My faith is just what keeps me steady in the times where I feel like I'm a bit overwhelmed, like, you know, I can't control the stuff that's going on around me. And the way that we have faith for our everyday lives is just by constantly aligning our hearts with who God is. The way we have faith is by reminding our stressed little minds that God is trustworthy. Even if the stuff that we're seeing around us doesn't make sense, He is trustworthy and that He is in control and that He cares for us. And then we have to choose to really believe it. In Exodus, this is how God said, spoke about himself. Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. 
I'm slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I can trust a God like this. This is the God that we put our faith in, not in the goals, but in the person of Jesus. And he gave us tools to stay steady. One way is by surrounding ourselves with other people who have faith with us. I'm so grateful for people in my life and on my life journey who does this with me. People who pray for us and encourage us and who are willing to walk this journey of life with us. And even people who allow God to use them to be a blessing into our lives. Like the anonymous people who put gifts into our bank accounts. That doesn't often happen, obviously, but but there are other examples as well. And you find these people in church, in a connect group, in as you get involved in the life of the church. You rub shoulders with people like, like that. Could I perhaps be someone like that for you today? I would love to pray with you, especially if you feel like you've never actually made that decision for yourself, the decision to, to trust God, to really believe that He is who He says He is and to let Him be your anchor and your foundation. Or perhaps you're somebody who says, I know, but I want to make a decision to believe what I know. I want to choose to trust God with my life, with all of it. I want to let Him guide me and steer me. And, and in the process, I just want to totally trust Him and give over to Him. If, if that's you, I would love to pray with you. And, and, and perhaps even as you're watching from home or wherever, you can just put your hand on your heart just as a symbol of saying, God, that's me. It's you doing something physical, just saying to God, I don't want to be excluded. I don't want to miss the bus. And so let's pray, God, thank you that as we come to you, all that's really required of us is for us to believe that you say who you are and that you care about us enough to respond to us. We don't need to be holy in any crazy way. We don't need to have it all together. We don't need to have the answers. But all that's required is that we believe that you are who you say you are and you meet us there. And so right now, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come into our hearts and bring clarity and bring comfort and bring an assurance of faith and salvation into our hearts. God, may there be a sense of purpose and excitement that rises up in our hearts as we choose to trust you. I pray for vision as we, as we just submit our lives to you. Would, we, would you give us vision for our lives, for our futures, for, for our world? And so Jesus, I thank you that, that when we reach out to you, when we seek you, you will always be faithful to respond to us. And so we can be confident that you hear us, that you see us, and that you will do something in our hearts. We give our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Right now, we'll participate in worship through our giving. Giving is an act of faith. As we give today our money that is so close to our hearts, we're saying to God, God, I have faith in you, not just for my money, but for my life, my whole entire life to be used by God to expand the kingdom in our families, in our workplace, through our local church, in our city, and on our, on our nation. Giving is an act of faith. What are you trusting God for today? Think about it as you give. The giving details are on the screen. The Hello Crew will be going around the aisle if you are in person today with us. There's a car facility as well in the foyer. Thank you for being a generous church that you are.